May the peace and the grace of God reign in your heart and in my heart. In this moment that we are going to spend together studying His Holy Word. Called to a mission. God has a mission on earth to make known the amazing plan of salvation to everybody. In this mission, the one who is a beneficiary turns into an instrument in the hands of God to benefit to others. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live into themselves, but into him which died for them and rose again. Once we benefit of the gospel, we have to turn into tools, into instruments that God is going to use to share the truth to others. Now, the natural tendency of the human being is to continue in his comfort zone even after being beneficiary by the gospel. What message does God have for the comfort one? For the Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 14 to 16, it is written, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. We are going to understand the purpose of God for our lives only when we're going to leave our conveniences, only when we're going to leave our comfort zone. In all times, God called men that after receiving the light of the gospel, turned themselves into his heralds. Christ Object Lessons, page 125 says, all who receive the gospel message into the heart will long to proclaim it. And page 280 says even more, we can never be saved in indolence and inactivity. Call to a mission. Let's talk about the example of some people of the Old Testament that have been called by God to realize this great mission. The first missionary that received the call has been Noé. Noé had a really hard mission to preach to an unholy generation dedicated to pleasures and licentiousness. In Genesis 6.3, God himself says through Noé, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Look at a wonderful thought we can find in the story of redemption, page 62. More than one hundred years before the flood, the Lord sent an angel to faithful Noah, to make known to him that he would no longer have mercy upon the corrupt race, but he would not have them ignorant of his design. He would instruct Noah and make him a faithful preacher to warn the world of its coming destruction, that the inhabitant of the earth might be left without excuse. Noah has a double mission. And he has been faithful to both, to warm the world and to save his family. To Hebrews, in the chapter 11, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, By faith, Noah being wanted of God, are things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So Noah had a mission to warn the antediluvian world of destruction, but his priority was as well to prepare his family. Noah had been faithful to his mission. The story of redemption, page 63, says, But for more than 100 years he persevered in his efforts to turn men to repentance and to God. For more than a hundred years, this missionary persevered in his efforts to turn back men into God. 
Every blow struck upon the ark was preaching to the people. Now the question is, what have been the result of his missionary work? Did he saw some fruits of the work he realized for more than a century? The story of redemption, page 63, says, Methuselah, the grandfather of Noah, lived until the very year of the flood, and there were others who believed the preaching of Noah and aided him in building the ark who died before the flood of waters came upon the earth. So, some who heard the preaching repented, and they helped the patriarch to build the ark. They just didn't enter because they died before the flood. In the sequence, in Genesis 7, verse 1 and 7, the reward is even bigger. He said he had a double mission, and he didn't neglect none of these two missions. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And Noah went in, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Noah as well saved his family. The second missionary, called by God to a great mission in the patriarchal time, is Abraham. He had to leave Ur of the Chaldees in the south of Mesopotamia to go to Palestine, to Canaan, where were living the Amorous. He received the call to the mission and he didn't hesitate. Genesis 12 verse 1 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. Now I have a question, dear friend. Why did he have to leave his land? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 126 says, God has a work for them to do, Abraham and his family. But a life of easy and the influence of friends and kindred would hinder the development of the very threats essential for its accomplishment. So, an easy life and the influence of friends and kindred would hinder the mission of Abraham. That's why God told him, leave your land, leave your kindred for a land that I will show you. Now, an interesting question is, how was the character of this missionary? How was it? Page 75 of Story of Redemption. His character was marked for integrity, generosity, and hospitality. His godly example and righteous cross united with his faithful instructions to his servants and all his household led them to fear, love, and reverence the God of Abraham. Very interesting. His character was marked by integrity, generosity, and hospitality. His godly example influenced many people to worship and to obey the God he was reverencing. Now, when they arrived in the land of Canaan, they faced people that were totally idolater. On the hills and under almost every tree, they saw idols of these people. They could find in the woods the altars of these false gods, and human sacrifices were offered on the high places around. Page 127 of Patriarchs and Prophets. In front of so many pagan altars, Abraham started to build altars to the God creator of the sky and the earth to show the difference between the idols they were worshipping and the Almighty God the one he was serving. Wherever he pitched his tent, close beside it posted up his altar, calling all within his encampment to the morning and evening sacrifice. When his tent was removed, the altar remained. In following years, there were those among the roving Canaanites who received instruction from Abraham, and whenever one of these came to that altar, 
He knew who had been there before him, and when he had pitched his tent, he repaired the altar and there worshipped the God of Abraham, the living God. Page 128 of the book Patriarchs and Prophets. How many souls have been gained by the work of this missionary? How many souls have been reached when he decided to fulfill the mission given by God? The inspiration says that between Aaron and Canaan, there have been more than a thousand people reached, more than a thousand souls gained and saved, rescued from the paganism to the worship of the true God. Those who were led by his teachings to worship the one God found a hope in his campment. And here, as in a school, they received such instruction as would prepare them to be representatives of the true faith. Thus, a great responsibility rested upon him. He was training heads of families and his methods of government would be carried out in the households over which they should preside. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 141. Now, let's talk about a missionary that fled the mission. We've talked about Noah, we've talked about Abraham that accepted the mission and that had very successful results, amazing results. But now we are going to talk about a missionary that decided to flee the mission. We all know about him. It is Jonas. His mission was to preach in a foreign country, Nineveh the capital of Assyria. Now I ask to you, how was Nineveh? It was a center of crime and wickedness. Inspiration has characterized it as the bloody city, full of lies and robbery. Now, how did God sow Nineveh? Yet Nineveh, weak though it had become, was not wholly given over to evil perceived in that city many who were reaching out after something better and higher, and who, if granted opportunity to learn of the living God, would put away their evil deeds and worship Him. So, in the middle of this city, surrendered to evil deeds and violence, God saw many souls who were acting evil because they didn't know the true God. Who did chose God? God chose Jonah as his instrument to bring his warning word to the city. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Unfortunately, when this missionary received the call, when he received the mission, he stopped to think about the difficulties he was about to face. As a prophet, thought of the difficulties and seeming impossibilities of this commission, he was tempted to question the wisdom of the call. While he was hesitating and doubting, Satan charged him with discouragement. Satan will always work to discourage us, to demotivate us, so we do not complete the mission, the great mission. God is entrusting us. God is giving us. Let's never forget one thing. Every time God is calling us, He gives us the guarantee of success. He doesn't say that we will not cross struggles and difficulties, but he gives us the guarantee of success. In the charge given him, Jonah had been entrusted with a heavy responsibility, yet he who had bidden him go was able to sustain his servant and grant him success. Unfortunately, 
Jannah followed a different way. The inspiration says that afraid Jannah rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. Instead of going to Nineveh, he followed a totally contrary way, going to Tarshish. Between the land of Canaan and Nineveh, there were 800 kilometers. From Canaan to Tarshish, there were 3,500 kilometers. And he decided to go to the farthest place to flee his mission, to desert his commission. But God didn't allow him to follow peacefully his way. We all know the story. Soon after he entered to the boat, God sent a big tempest. But entering in the boat, where did God Jana? He went to the hold of the boat. There he arranged a bed as comfortable as possible. And he fell in a deep sleep, in a peaceful sleep. As a missionary that is not praying about the mission, the sky is falling apart and he is at peace. Jonah chapter 1 verse 5 says, Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. Leaves the sides of commodity, of silent, of idleness. We as well today, like Jannah, we can go to the hold, the hold of commodity, of silence and idleness. And now when the boat crew understood who is the responsible for the tempest, they asked to Jannah, what shall we do to calm the sea? And the prophet himself gives the solution. Throw me to the sea, and the sea will calm down, because I know it's my fault this big tempest came on you. Then they threw him to the sea, as we know the story. The Lord sent a big fish to swallow Jannah, and Jannah had a travel a long way in the alive submarine. Seeing the death very close to him, Jannah begged for the Lord's favor. With penitence and a recognition of the saving grace of God came deliverance. Once more, the servant of God was commissioned to warn Nineveh. Did he fled again? Did he try to be exempted? No. When the fish delivered Jonah on the beach, the commission came back. The divine order again. He heard the word of God for a second time. Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach into it the preachings that I bide thee. This time he did not stop to question or doubt, but obeyed without hesitation, without questioning the word of God. As Jonah entered the city, he began at once to cry against it the message, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. From street to street, he went sounding the note of warning, and the message given by the missionary was not in vain. The cry that rang through the streets of the godless city was passed from lip to lip. The Spirit of God pressed the message home to every heart and caused multitudes to tremble because of their sins and to repent in deep humiliation. What has been the result of Jonah's work in Nineveh? The inspiration says that the warning message came into the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and he causeth 
it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh, that men and animals, everyone, shall fast, covered with sackcloth, and cry mighty unto God. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his spicy anger that we perish not? What has been the result of this work? God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And while the Spirit of God was working in the heart of all men of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, what was doing Jonah? What was he doing? He just went up to a hill and maketh to himself a booth, and sitteth in there eating the shade, till that he seeth what is in the city. This behavior of Jonah reveals a bad missionary. We do the mission with the desire to see souls saved, not hoping their ruin, not hoping their destruction. When Jonah learned of God's purpose to spare the city that notwithstanding its wickedness had been led to repent in sackcloth and ashes, he should have been the first to rejoice because of God's amazing grace. But instead, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of his being regarded as a false prophet. Jealous of his reputation, he lost sight of the infinitely greater value of the souls in that wretched city. His welfare was above his preoccupation for the souls, and this must not happen with the missionary that received from God this noble mission. He shall consider better to die than to live, to see the city to be condemned. We all know the gold lesson. God made a gold grow over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head. And during the night, God let a warm bite the gold and it withered. And when he complained about it, God told him, Thou hast had piety on the gold for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should not I spare Nineveh, an that great city wherein are more than six thousand persons that cannot discern between their right and their left hand? and also much cattle. With no merits, Jonah got the privilege to work 40 days and to gain 120,000 souls. What mission we had such a success like Jonah? Even in the Christian church, with the power of the Holy Spirit in the Pentecostal days, one sermon converted 3,000 people, another sermon 5,000. But Jonah in 40 days has been an instrument to save from ruin and destruction 120,000 people. What lesson can we learn today? Patriarchs and Kings, page 274. The lesson is for God's messengers today. The lesson is for me and for you. Ambassadors are to point men to the nobler world, which has largely been lost sight of, especially in the time we are living in, the Laodicea time. According to the teaching of the Holy Scriptures, the only city that will endure is the city whose builder and maker is God. And it is to this city that you and I, we have to attract, to call the attention of humanity. We shall not discourage facing the ungodliness in the city, fulfilling the mission in our time. Today, God's messengers in the great city are not to become discouraged over the weakness like Jonah did, over the injustice, the depravity, 
which they are called upon to face while endeavoring to proclaim the glad tidings of salvation. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I have much people in this city. The order given by God to the Apostle Paul when in Corinth is given to each and every one of us when we face wickedness, when we face deprivation in the big cities. And even if a big part of humanity is committed to pleasures and sin, among them there are many sincere souls that being reached by the gospel message, they will repent and decide themselves for the eternal truth. Now, what does God say to all of those who attend the call to the mission? What does he say? Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and courageous, be not terrified, nor affrighted, for with thee is Jehovah thy God in every place whither thou goest. So don't be afraid, be courageous, don't be afraid, nor affrighted, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever you go. Even if we have to live a life of struggles, like all missionaries before us, heaven guarantees us a reward. A reward? When? When we will arrive to our home. Let's look at the experience of a missionary couple of Europe. The church called this couple to be missionary workers, and their mission wasn't easy. They had to preach the gospel in countries where religious freedom was restricted, and they worked for more than 50 years. They've been prisoners, flogged, they passed through many difficulties and adversities, and he got a brain tumor, and he had to leave the country he was working in to do the surgery. He recovered, but he could not work as he used to, till the church understood that they could not actively work anymore. Then they received from the church a retiring letter for both. And with the letter, they received two both tickets to come back to their country, to their home. They've been very surprised when they were to enter in the boat and they realized that the tickets the church gave to them were for the cheapest part of the boat, the simplest place of the boat where the place where they were about to travel. They got a bit frustrated, but they traveled back to their home that suffered the passing time. While traveling, they were motivating each other, and when they were arriving to the port, they saw that there was a lot of people in the port with musicians and people moving their flags. So he said to his wife, look, my love, the church gathered all the churches of the city to receivers. Because after 50 years of mission, we are back, back to home. But what a surprise. They've been the last ones to leave the boat because of the tickets they had. And when they left the boat, there were no musicians anymore, no people celebrating. Their flags were on the floor, then they understood that the reception wasn't for them, it was for a famous person that traveled on first class, maybe a football player, or an actor, or a famous singer. There were nobody to receive them, not even the leader of the church were there to congratulate them and to say thank you for the 50 years of mission. What a big deception for this missionary. From the port to the house, he didn't say a word. When he arrived home, 
an old house because of the passing time, he entered, put his suitcase away, and his wife said, Darling, let's organize our home. He said, No, I'm going out for a walk. I need to cool down. He went out while his wife was organizing the house. He stayed out almost two hours, and when he was back, his wife saw that he was really sad and disappointed, so she tried to cheer him up. Then he looked to her and he said, This is the reward. This is the reward of more than 50 years of work for the mission, suffering, struggles. That is the reward we get when we are back home. Tell me, this is the reward. Then she looked to him and she said, We didn't arrive home yet. We didn't arrive home yet. When we will be home, we will receive our retribution. Psalm 126, verse 5 and 6 says, Those sowing in tears with seeking do reap, whoso goeth on and reapeth, bearing the basket of seeds, surely cometh in with seeking, bearing his sheaves. Do you want to be a useful missionary in the cause of Christ? Do you want? If not here, where? And if not today, when? May God give us his grace to you and to me, so that hearing the call, we may say like the prophet Isaiah, Here am I, sent me. And the reward we will receive it when we will be home. May God give us his grace and help us. This is our desire and prayer. Amen.